Hi, thanks for coming today. I'm Ryan. Um, I run a couple of groups at Microsoft, as you just heard about. One of them is the Open Source Incubations Group. Uh, and in this group, we incubate new ideas. We take them to the open source community. And if we can build a community around it, it may turn into a new product at, at Microsoft. The other group I run is uh, called Open Source uh, Ecosystem. And the ecosystem team is responsible for thinking about our overall strategy for how we work with the open source community and how we work with uh, standards organizations. I'm here to talk about a big opportunity I think we have as a, as a community. Um, and opportunities come in all kinds of flavors. They can be small, they can be big. Um, I, I had an opportunity right after I finished college. I had uh, uh, taken a, a temp job at Microsoft. I was taking a year off before going to graduate school. And uh, um, I was doing filing in the payroll office. And they caught me hacking into the old Xenix-based email servers we had back then and offered me a job. And uh, it turned out to be a great opportunity to start working in, in tech and get to be here with, with everybody here. But we have big opportunities as well. And I really want to talk about what we can do as a community to really improve security. But first, I want to talk about some stuff that we're doing at Microsoft around what's called the Secure Future Initiative. And the Secure Future Initiative came about because we were looking at uh, exploits and incidents that happened to both Microsoft as well as, as other companies and trying to figure out how could we step back and really improve the way that we design, build, test, and operate software at scale? Um, and so we came up with the Secure Future Initiative, and it has six pillars. You know, the, these pillars span everything about the way that we, we build and operate software. They go from things like, how do we create identities and make sure that those identities are, are secure? How can we do things like remove secrets from being a, uh, part of our software, part of our source code? Today, I want to talk about what we're doing to protect engineering systems, um, which is another one of our pillars. And in this area of protecting engineering pillars, we tend to think a lot about things like, how do we make sure that the engineering system itself is secure? Um, how do we make sure that only people that should have access to that source code have access to the source code and can, can build uh, out of that source code? Uh, we also think about the supply chain. How is it that we're actually building that software from the moment that we have something that's in a repository to the process it goes through that entire supply chain and becomes something that's running in production at, at Microsoft? There are a couple of projects that we've built that uh, should help everybody with, with uh, how they build and use uh, open source. One of them is GitHub Dependabot. Anybody here use GitHub Dependabot? Raise your hand, a few people. Oh, a bunch. Okay, great. Uh, for those of you that don't know about GitHub Dependabot, it's, um, it's a service that can look at the dependencies in your repository and let you know if those dependencies have been updated. And it's not like you just get an alert that says, hey, by the way, you have to go update something. Uh, Dependabot actually generates the pull request that you can then merge that'll bring you up to date. It's very simple once you turn it on, and it makes it easy to keep up to date. And that's really important because sometimes those dependencies get updated to address security vulnerabilities, and it's hard for us to keep up to date on that without tools like Dependabot that automatically keep you up to date. Another service that we've built uh, is called Copacetic. Um, and Copacetic is actually a project that came out of my incubations group. And what Copacetic does is help all of us that are building container-based images keep our container-based images up to date. Uh, so imagine that uh, you're a team that uh, builds a container uh, service, something that's, that's running like on a Kubernetes cluster, and you've probably based that on a container image you got from somewhere else. Might have been you know, a Linux distribution that, that came from uh, another team, either in your company or somebody in the community. And just like with dependencies, it's hard to know when your dependencies have been updated. Sometimes it's also hard to know when that base image that you're based off of has been updated. And so we built Copacetic to help with this. And what Copacetic does is it uses open source scanners like Trivi to scan your container image, identify any kinds of vulnerabilities in it, and then provide that list of vulnerabilities to Copacetic. Copacetic will then download all of the required updates for your container and create a new layer in that OCI image, uh, that, a new patch layer that's right on top. Um, and by doing that, you now have an, an image effectively that's been patched without your engineering team having to go back and rebuild from a new container image. We've patched it later. 
you can actually patch it in the build pipeline. There's like a GitHub action for this. So if you use GitHub and you use GitHub actions as the way that you build your, your software, you can turn on Copacetic right there. And Copacetic will operate as you build your, your image. It goes to Copacetic. Copacetic makes sure that it's patched, and then it gets pushed into your container registry. Uh, Copacetic is an open source project. It's a CNCF sandbox project, so you can use it right now. Uh, there are a number of, of people that are using it in production. We're actually rolling it into production in every single container build pipeline across Microsoft. So uh, it's been incredibly successful for us. And I think there's some external products that are using it as well. Um, I think CubeScope is, is using Copacetic as part of its uh, package. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at, at Copacetic. The, uh, the, the problem of how we improve software and software security is bigger than just you know, what we're doing inside of Microsoft for our own code. It, it expands to all of us that are building off of open source software. Uh, and so in 2020, we were one of the co-founders for the Open Source Security Foundation. And it's because, you, first of all, we're big consumers of open source ourselves. And second, we need to make sure that we can address security across all of uh, this open source software. Uh, and so we really got on board with the mission here to sustainably secure the development, maintenance, and consumption of open source software. It's a, it's a big deal. And the big opportunity for all of us uh, to, to consider today is if we can improve the security of open source software, make it more secure by, by design in the way that we build it, in the way that we deploy it, uh, it can have even more impact than it's had so far. And that's hard to imagine because open source software has had so much impact for us as an industry. But I think if we can keep going and, and change the way that it's secured and deployed and operated, it'll have even more opportunity to make things better for all of us. Now, in the OpenSSF, we also think about supply chain security. Uh, and we've built out a number of, of uh, diagrams like this that help us think about what are the risks in any kind of supply chain. And those risks can be all over the place. They can be uh, at the very beginning of that supply chain. We might not uh, require code reviews for code to be checked into a repository. Uh, so that can be one kind of vector for, for attack. There could be other vectors as well, like we might be um, using a compromised package repo and not know about it. Uh, and so that would be another a vector of attack. In the OpenSSF, we've looked at this, and we have a ton of projects that are focused on, on how to make this better. There's so many, you probably can't read it from where you're sitting in the audience. There we go. Um, but it's a big deal. If we can improve the way that our supply chain security works through a number of these different projects, we can make things better for all of us as, as an industry. And one of the things that we contributed uh, from Microsoft is something called the Supply Chain Consumption uh, framework, S2C2F. It's a bit of a mouthful. Um, but we started thinking in 2019 about how we could be more intentional, how could we could be more thoughtful about the way that we were consuming open source software at, at Microsoft. And part of that was building this framework that helped us think comprehensively about that consumption. And so one of those things is, at the very beginning, we think about how do we ingest that open source software? And then how do we keep it up to date? How do we uh, go ahead and rebuild it when necessary or, or audit uh, that code to make sure that it's, it's a, uh, adhering to all of our policies? We brought this framework to the OpenSSF in 2022 uh, and designed it in a way that it's, you know, it's vendor agnostic. It doesn't matter if you're using Azure or GCP or, or AWS. You can still use this framework. In fact, you don't even have to be using a public cloud provider to be able to take advantage of S2C2F as a framework to help you be more thoughtful about the way that you're using open source software in your own pipelines. And I get a lot of questions about how S2C2F relates to some of the other work that we do in the OpenSSF. One of those is uh, Salsa. And Salsa is really about how do we produce code? How do we make sure that we have a good build pipeline that produces high quality code? It's a great framework. And if you haven't had a chance to take a look at Salsa, highly encourage you to do so. S2C2F is really about how we consume code. Uh, but because we get a lot of these kinds of questions, we're going forward with a, a path to bring S2C2F and Salsa together into a single framework. 
uh, and working with the, the Salsa working group to merge this together. So we can really think about this as just two sides of the same coin. One side's about how do we ingest open source code, and the other side is about how we produce code. And so these, these two are, are coming together. So that helps with the way that we, th we think about uh, uh, ingesting and producing code. The supply chain itself, though, can use a lot of improvements. And in fact, one of the biggest improvements can come from making sure that that supply chain is more transparent, that it's easier to understand how these supply chains work. And so we started working with the IETF on a proposal called SKIT. And SKIT is the Supply Chain Integrity, Transparency, and Trust Project. And it's designed to be a generic, interoperable, and scalable architecture that improves transparency about the supply chain itself. And so why would we want to do something like SKIT? You know, there are a lot of different kinds of projects around supply chain security. And one of the things that we realized was that uh, many different parties participate in building code. So, so if I'm the, the, a company that's building software, you know, I might generate that code. I might have a, an SBOM, a software bill of materials that comes along with that code. Uh, but I might have actually used a third party to do the build. And I might want attestations from that third party that show that that build environment that they created for me was actually secure. And, and if I produce binaries as part of my product, I might also want an antivirus company to come along and scan that code and provide some sort of attestation that there's, there's no virus embedded in my code. All of those are aspects of the supply chain, and so we needed a way to be able to create supply chains that supported multiple parties. We also needed a way to consume that data and record it in a way that's transparent. And transparent is just a really nice way of saying that parties can't lie without being detected. Finally, we needed to make sure that the way that we built this supply chain transparency system was, was open, that anybody could build one. It wasn't tied to a particular vendor. So that's why we went and worked with the IETF on building SKIT. Uh, now there are a bunch of things you can do with something like Skit once you have it up and running. One of those things is uh, you can create these transparent uh, uh, documents that think, then can be used in a variety of different ways. And that includes um, being able to analyze all of your source code that's been built to see how that software is, is uh, what, what's com contained inside of it, as well as what CVEs might be associated with it or uh, VEC statements that might tell you whether or not vulnerabilities can actually be exploited in that code. But all of that stuff can be, can be stored in this kind of supply chain system like Skit. And so we're working with Skit to finalize, or we're working with the IETF to finalize the Skit proposal. And at Microsoft, we're in the process of also building an implementation of Skit that'll be open source and that we're going to bring to the OpenSSF, hopefully in the first half of next year. Now, Building something like Skid or, or, or it requires two parts. There are two halves to Skid. One half is how do you write data into something like Skid, and the other half is how do you consume that data. And on the right side, it's pretty simple. Your build system will generate some sort of code and an SBOM that goes along with it, and then we can hand that off to a transparency service. That transparency service will make sure that you know, the SBOM has been created correctly, you know, that syntactically it's correct. Uh, and it'll also make sure that the signature that you've used to sign it is, is okay. You know, it hasn't expired, it hasn't been revoked. And then it'll generate a counter signature. And that counter signature will get recorded in a durable log. That durable log can be any durable log that, uh, that you like. Um, it'll also countersign that SBOM, and that countersigned SBOM can then be put in a place where you can read it later. Container registries are a great place to do that. So you could write it into something like the Azure Container Registry or the Elastic Container Registry or a variety of different kinds of, of systems. Then you can use this data. And on the right-hand side of this slide, you can see how this data can, can be consumed. You can consume it directly out of the Container Registry. But what's really powerful is if you put it into a graph database where it can be read using tools like Guac, which is another OpenSSF project that enables you to kind of look at this big graph of data uh, about how software has been built, what kinds of vulnerabilities it has, and how it can be used. Anyway, we're, we're, uh, we're working on Skit, making sure that it's an open standard. It can be built by us, it can be built by AWS, it can be built by Google, it can be built by you, if you like. And that concludes my presentation. I, I hope if there's one thing you took away, it's that uh, if we improve security of open source software, the impact could be enormous. It could be uh, much bigger than, than the impact of open source has been so far, which is 
is great. Uh, and hopefully you'll take some time and look at the OpenSSF and hopefully lean in and join us in securing open source software. With that, thank you very much for your time today. Have a great conference.